Um, so uh, if if uh, it's all right with you, we'll get started with the uh, presentation. And uh, on on the first slide, uh, this is just to to tell the story how we got interested in uh, the Chiari malformation type one. Being a, a child neurologist, we don't get the chance to see that many patients with uh, with this disorder, since as you know, uh, in most cases, uh, symptoms begin later on um, uh, during life. But uh, speaking to one of our neurosurgeons, uh, Dr. Antonia Polka, uh, she brought to my attention the family you are, and now the pedigree you are seeing in the slide, and it was quite uh, interesting to see that many uh, affected individuals with Chiari, two of them, uh, subjects 128 and 1210, had been already operated upon. Uh, so it seemed like a pedigree with a, with a pattern of inheritance close to autosomal dominant. And we thought that it should be uh, at least uh, uh, it, it would like feasible to find a, a locus in such a family. Um, so uh, th that was the first our first uh, contact with research in in Chiari, in Chiari one. Uh, what we did was to use the uh, usual operational criteria for diagnosis. So simply the tonsillar ectopia on sagittal MRI according to the uh, Barkovich well-known criteria and we assumed probably wrongly uh, as, as we as we look at this in retrospect that uh, most cases were caused by uh, um, an underdeveloped posterior cranial fossa uh, because this is uh, the uh, let's say uh, mechanistic or, or or the hypothesis we followed as as uh, as underlying most cases uh, of Chiari one at the point we knew at the, at the time that there was uh, the usual uh, evidences uh, pointing to heritability of the disorder, including family aggregation. Although there were uh, not very many reports previously indicating uh, familial aggregation. Uh, of course, this could indicate both genetic or environmental factors. There was the uh, higher concordance in uh, monozygotic twins versus dizygotic. And of course, the association to many known syndromes, all of it indicating a genetic component. You probably are all familiar with this, uh, with this fact. Uh, you know, the, the, many, the many syndromes, particularly uh, neurofibromatosis type 1 as a, as a, as a uh, frequent co-occurrence of uh, Chiari 1 malformation and many other. And on the other hand, also probably discussed in previous meetings, we don't know the exact prevalence in the population. There is the, the uh, already uh, classical study by, by Meadows and colleagues suggesting a, a prevalence of 1 in 1,280, an estimation of asymptomatic carriers around 14%. And also the study by Fournoy in uh, 2007, which estimated uh, uh, a prevalence close to 0.9% in, uh, in the general population by just by re reviewing uh, MRIs, uh, MRI studies performed to uh, healthy individuals. So, uh, we really didn't know what to look uh, for in, in Chiari, whether this is a rare variant common disease. We are clearly below uh, the threshold of rare diseases, or perhaps a common variant common disease uh, uh, situation, kind of situation. So, in, in, in planning how to, how to tackle all, all this uh, uh, problem, we considered all possible uh, situations. Uh, on, on the one hand, we had our uh, familial cases where one would expect rare uh, variants with uh, rather high penetrance. 
uh, for which we would use uh, classically linkage analysis and perhaps uh, afterwards a uh, screen of, of, of candidate genes or with the new technologies, maybe exome, whole exome or genome uh, sequencing or analysis of, of uh, copy number variants. On the other hand, considering the uh, a, a frequency close to 1%, we, end of the spectrum and, and consider whether this is a complex disorder with both environmental and genetic uh, factors and then uh, a logical approach would be using association studies and compare uh, genetic variability uh, between a control and an affected population. So the, the projects that were started uh, like uh, six years ago where the study of familial uh, CM1, including linkage analysis and then exome analysis of the uh, multi-generational family I showed and a few other with more than two affected individuals. Uh, the study of sporadic uh, CM1 uh, by means of uh, association studies, candidate association studies, uh, case versus controls. We also have, uh, have performed uh, mutational screen of, of candidates in, in CM2 patients, which this is not related to today's topic. And then we have uh, looked into uh, DNA methylation changes in uh, a, a, a small series of uh, uh, human tissues at the level of the defect in, in, in neural tube defects, which is, uh, again, uh, I won't go into that in, in today's presentation. So regarding the uh, Mendelian forms, what we had when we began the, the study was only the, the work by uh, Boyles and, and a group of, of Lane Mars Spear in, uh, in the American Journal of Medical Genetics that showed uh, loss at, loss at chromosome 9 and 15. And we didn't have, uh, of course, knowledge of, of the recent work by by, uh, well, the publication by uh, Marconis and, and colleagues, which appeared last year and, and, and I think that has been already discussed in, in this meeting. So, um, this is the, the family I was referring to, and we performed a, a genome-wide linkage analysis using uh, a single nucleotide polymorphism, uh, polymorphic markers. Uh, and we had these 12 cases you see as affected in here in, in the first stage we use a only affected analysis to facilitate uh, the process of statistical analysis uh, and one of the first problems we run in, into is that, that uh, status assignment uh, uh, so that's to say uh, healthy versus affected was not easy because we run into several individuals in the family which are labeled in, in gray here with uh, tonsillar descent which sometimes was just a few millimeters below the three or five uh, usual uh, value for diagnosis and one of the things that we, that we considered was measuring the posterior fossa of all the members of the family so as, as to uh, uh, assign uh, an affected status independently of the tonsillar descent. And that uh, gave rise to the uh, study that uh, Inzane will tell you in a minute uh, uh, to compare uh, post the cranial uh, posterior fossa from controls and, and uh, patients. Just, just in order to be able to classify patients in, in this pedigree. Uh, once, once we consider uh, the only affected the strategy, uh, we found uh, those peaks in the in the linkage analysis in in chromosomes 16 and 18. Mm, but as as you as you probably uh, have discussed before in in previous meetings, a lot of score between in two and three is just suggestive of linkage uh, but not uh, a positive uh, or not a definite uh, signal for 
for linkage. And we did what we did next was to add as uh, also I wanted to mention that um, we had a, a, an individual that ought to be a, a phenocopy, so that was uh, a problem. And um, when we added, I'm sorry to go back. Uh, when we added more more individuals, not just the the the, the nucleus that you are seeing here, but but the whole pedigree. And we added more uh, markers in the in uh, in the in the regions that that showed uh, uh, a, ten, a, a tendency to to linkage. We found this uh, uh, locus in chromosome 17, which showed a, a multipunctual uh, LOT score above uh, three. Uh, we then we then uh, thought of uh, looking into candidates, but unfortunately, this is a huge region spanning 42 megabases, as you can see here, with over 300 positional candidate genes, and uh, the, the, our only uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, then we it, it doesn't it somewhere somehow it doesn't. Uh, appear here, but what what we did was uh, sequencing one of the uh, candidates in the region, which happens to be the SUS1, uh, SUS12 gene, which had been associated with uh, uh, neural tube defects and, and Chiari-like pathology in in the mice when, when uh, occurring in haploid insufficiency, but we found no disease-causing mutations in, in that SUS12 gene. And then we moved into a uh, whole uh, sequencing. This is an ongoing project now. We, we have performed uh, some sequencing in six uh, individuals of the, of the family and have also added a few more, uh, uh, four individuals more from another three families. But up to now, we have found no clear uh, disease causing variant. So this might become uh, the topic of future uh, discussion. And then regarding the sporadic CM1, I will go rapidly through this. Uh, we, we thought of uh, devising a, a association study using candidate genes. Of course, candidate genes are not at all clear in, in Chiari 1. So we, we elected uh, several pathways that we thought could be uh, relevant in terms of the known or the supposed uh, pathogenesis of the disorder. As, as, as you all know, one of the possibilities for, for many uh, classical uh, Chiari uh, malformations is that uh, the, the uh, insufficient uh, uh, occipital bone formation may result from an alteration during the third and, four, and fourth week of gestation when the when the uh, occipital somites fuse and give and give rise to the occipital bone, so we looked into the uh, genetic pathways involved in in that process. Basically, what is called the uh, segmentation clock uh, and the determination front, where uh, cycles cycles of, of gene expression control the uh, differentiation from. Uh, 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 from uh, undifferentiated uh, mesodermal cells towards differentiated, and then the appearance of the uh, sequential somite, which is a project occurring in uh, a process occurring in around uh, two to four somites uh, are formed per day, and when uh, the retinoic acid is uh, a pathway it's expressed, it, that means differentiation while FGF and wind expression tend to retain uh, those immature cells in, in an undifferentiated state. Uh, so that was one of the, of the pathways. And this is also uh, relevant since, uh, you know, the, from classical <laughs> experimental work by Marin Padilla, that uh, retinoic acid is able to induce a, a whole spectrum of uh, neural tube defects and also including Chiari 1 uh, malformation. 
uh, and again also this uh, retinoic acid pathway is, uh, is uh, strictly regulated by, by other pathways which are relevant like NUTCH and, and WIND as, as I mentioned, FGF, so we covered uh, all, of, all of these genes with, uh, with markers and, and uh, I mean they were fully covered with SNPs and uh, and Anjani will tell you in a, in a minute about this. And finally, just to mention that uh, in, in a recent, uh, this, is, this is a published uh, uh, work by Marin Padilla, but, but he suggested that maybe there could be a placental vascular insufficiency uh, at the time of the, of the uh, origin of Chiari malformation and if, if we were finding familial cases it might make sense to look into uh, molecules involved in the transition from diffusive uh, nutrition in the in the second and third week of uh, embryonic life towards a vascular type of nutrition and maybe something uh, going wrong in that in that uh, transition might originate an insufficient an insufficiency of the paraxial mesoderm. So we also examine variants in in those genes, uh, mostly of the VEGF uh, family. So I, I'll switch into Einzane, and and she will go through the results section. Uh, thank you. All right, so I'm just going to switch over to her now. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, can you share your screen now? Ansani? Yes. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Um, yes. yes, we see it. Yes, okay. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Um, as Alfonso has said, I'm going to continue with the results from our morphometric and genetic analysis. And well, uh, as you know, traditionally it has been considered that the main cause of carry malformation type 1 is a small posterior corneal fossa. Uh, but however, Miller and colleagues identified different mechanisms for the cerebral tonsil herniation showing that the classical radiological diagnostic criteria includes an heterogeneous group of patients with tonsillar descent produced by a variety of etiological factors. Uh, sorry, because my presentation doesn't work. Yeah, no. Well, uh, to characterize those patients with an hypoplastical posterior corneal fossa, and discriminate them from other carrier malformation type 1 patients, we perform a morphometric study based on magnetic resonance imaging. For this study, we select 100 carrier uh, malformation type 1 patients with a tonsillar distance of 5 or more millimeters and 50 contours with a first clinical episode of multiple uh, sclerosis, and who were presumed to reflect the normal population in terms of posterior canal fossa morphology. In both cohorts, uh, the individuals were adults and present the same male-female ratio to minimize age and self-related changes in the size of the skull and brain structures. So uh, we performed 19 different measurements related with the posterior cranial fossa from a mid-sagittal sli uh, slice. Uh, this includes measurements of several neural structures to, uh, for a main magnum, such as the corpus callosum, fastidium, and odontoid. Other measurements were performed in the posterior corneal force, uh, strictly speaking, such as the length of the clivus, supraoccipital, tentorium, or posterior corneal force area, its height and width. And finally, uh, we measure the angles formed by different structures of the posterior corneal fossa, such as the, the tentorium angle, the Wackenheim angle, or the basal angle. This, this difference between cases and control in ten of the 19 selected measurements. As expected, after applying multiple comparison correction by Bonferroni, the most significant difference were observed for the tonsillar herniation used as the selection criteria. 
The following more significantly different uh, measurements were those related with the height of the posterior cranial fossa, um, how, uh, such as the distance from the foramen magnum to the corpus callosum bones or vestigium. In addition, the clivus length and posterior cranial fossa and posterior cranial fossa osseus were reduced in patient group. And also it's interesting to remark that the basal angle uh, was more obtuse in patients. In contrast to previous published morphometric studies, um, the average length of the supraoccipital and the anterior posterior diameter of the foramen magnum didn't show significant difference between two the groups. The fact that, the, uh, that we found difference in the length of the clavus but not in the chondrocranium derived by the occipital may be due to the limited number of patients where a clear visualization of the sphenoccipital sign chondrosis was possible. It was in total in 22 patients. Uh, in order to identify the most reviews measures uh, to differentiate patients from controls posterior cranial fossa, a predictive model was developed using the screening module of the G uh, GMP software, which ranks the variable effects in a similar way to a forward stepwise regression. Later, a logistic regression model was fitted using the SPSS software with the variables that maximize the classification properties. The resulting model includes up to seven variables that provide a high probability of accurate control cost classification. In particular, uh, the model revealed a sensitivity of 93% and a specificity of 92%, allowing the prediction of the diagnosis of KMR for time 1 regardless of the degree of consular descent. Uh, we had also a second core of patients composed of 32 individuals with symptoms and signs consistent with K-malformation tank 1, but with a tonsillar descent inferior to 5 millimeters, all of these. 24 of them had between uh, 5 and 3 millimeters, and 8 had less than 3. As you can see, uh, these patients present morphometric characteristics such as the clivus or basal angulation or corpus the distance of corpus callosum to foramen magnum, um, more similar to carry malformation type of patients, sorry, uh, than to the controls. When we apply the mathematical model to this group in order to predict carry malformation type one diagnosis on the basis of posterior cardiac fossa measures, result in 27 of them being correctly predicted as classical carry malformation type one patients, and five. Uh, being predicted as non care malformation type 1. Two of, the, two of these negative results correspond to patients with more than 5 millimeters of tonsillar descent, and these negative results could be attributed to the precision of the mathematical model that doesn't classify with 100% accuracy, or the presence of other mechanisms different of hypoplastic posterior cranial fossa that could produce tonsillar descent in, in those patients. Um, regarding the five cases with a tonsillar herniation inferior to 3 mm and classified as classical carry malformation type 1, they could be carry malformation type 0 patients. The fact that they are classified as carry malformation type 1 by the model suggests that they, are, uh, they are also have a small posterior cranial fossa. The results is in accordance with a previous study published by Marcunas and colleagues where they describe several families with both patients, Kelmarfeminsetan 1 and type 0, showing similar clinical and radiological features. The presence of, two, uh, of these two, uh, two types of patients in the same family suggests that these disorders may share an underlying genetic basis, although uh, additional epigenetic and or environmental factors are likely to play an important role in the development of k malformation type 0 versus type 1. For our association study, we select 384 check SNPs corresponding to 58 different target genes involved in the vasoccipital bone formation, vascular endothelial formation, and some associated disease such as neurofibromatosis type 1 and STAT3. 
in total uh, we recruit 500 DNA samples from blood and saliva corresponding to care malformation type of patients with more than 4 millimeters of tonsil of descent. Um, these patients come from the Valle de Hospital and different Spanish Care Malformation Type 1 associations. And for the genetic study, we select 450 non related Care Malformation Type 1 patients, uh, 590 sex match controls corresponding to general population. All, all the individuals were Caucasian of Spanish origin. After genotyping, 11 patients of five controls were excluded from the analysis as their genotyping rates were under 80%. And in the case of the SNPs, 303 from the original 384 based the quality control filters and were included in the analysis. Mm, when we performed the analysis of all single markers under an additive model in the whole patient sample, we found nominal associations for 18 SNPs located in 14 different genes. Only five of these SNPs located in the genes CDX1, FLT1 and rare gene present a p-value lower than 0.01. However, uh, no marker uh, remains significant after applying multiple comparison corrections by 10% FDR. Mm, the absence of statistical significance in any of the analyzed genetic markers could be a consequence of having a group of care malformation type 1 patients diagnosed according to the criteria of the tonsillar descent, but independently of their etiological cause that, as we have mentioned before, can be very diverse. For the reason to identify those individuals with an hypoplastic posterior cranial fossa, we apply the predictive model based on magnetic resonance imaging previously developed. In this way, from a total of 211 individuals in which the magnetic resonance imaging image were available, 186 present an hypoplastic posterior cranial fossa and were considered as clinical type carrying malformation to one patient. As a consequence, the number of individuals for the genetic analysis was drastically re reduced, causing a decrease of the statistical power of the analysis. But on the other hand, we obtain a more homogeneous group of patients, therefore increasing the probability to find a common genetic curves. Um, when we repeat the analysis of all single markers under the additive model in only this classical type 1 carrying malformation type 1 patients, we found a nominal association in 26 SNPs located in 13 different genes. 10 of these SNPs, the double than those observed in the whole patient sample, showed a p-value lower than 0.01. It's interesting to note that three of these SNPs correspond to those previously detected in the whole sample, and that in the case of one of the SNPs located in the CDX1 gene, the significance of the association increases in, in one order of magnitude. In addition, in this analysis, four SNPs remain significant after applying multiple comparison corrections by 10% FDR. The haplotype analysis was addressed only for those LD blocks that include the SNPs that pass 10% FDR in the single marker analysis. And from the analysis, uh, we identify two, uh, two risk haplotypes located in the gene CDX1 and ALDH1A2. Regarding the potential functional relevance of the identified variants, four of the genes with the best association signals in the single marker analysis are directly or indirectly related with retinoic acid signaling during somatogenesis. This suggests that an alteration in the regulation of the retinoic acid pathway could be re resolved in anomalous somit formation and maybe to a reduced posterior corneal fossa. The results are in accordance with previous experimental observations of Dr. Marin Padilla, who induced fetal malformation similar to those patients in carry malformation type 1 and carry malformation type 2 patients after the administration of high doses of vitamin A in pregnant hamsters. 
uh, we also evaluated the, possi the possible relationship between genotypes of the forest nymphs in three genes that pass 10 percent of the air correction and any of the possible corneal morphological measurements performed on the, mag uh, on the magnetic resonance imaging studies of 211 patients. And a modest association was found between the two SNPs in ALDH 182 and the um, Wackenheim angle and the basal angle. The result is interesting because the vasoccipital bone is involved in both angles, indicating that these variants are associated with the inclination of, of the clivus. This is in accordance with the previous evidence pointing at an alteration in vasoccipital rather than suboccipital bone when related with carry malformation type 1. At this point, it's interesting to note that some of the genes in which we found association with carry malformation type 1, such as those involved in retinoic acid pathway, have also been studied in relation with their possible implication in the spina bifida and other neural tube defects, a characteristic in carry malformation type 2. However, until now, a strong association with disorders has not been demonstrated. And finally, uh, as a main conclusion and future directions of this work, we could say that the Kelly malformation type 1 diagnosis based on the solely tonsillar descent appears to hamper genetics and are both familiar and sporadic forms. A formula using simple magnetic resonance image based measurements may increase diagnostic accuracy and help identifying patients with classical carry malformation type 1. Variants uh, in genes involved in retinoic acid signaling regulating critical pathways during symmetogenesis may confer susceptibility to underdevelopment of posterior cranial fossa. The results are uh, wide replication on different and or larger cores and more powerful genotypic studies such as GWAS and next generation sequencing are not warranted as next logical steps in the study of the genetic basis of carry malformation type 1. And just to finish, um, I would like to say thank you to all the members of our research group in Barcelona, who of course were essential to make this work. To um, um, to other research groups uh, who also contribute to this work and also to our funding sources. And of course, also thank you for your attention. All right, thanks so much for this very interesting talk. Um, I'm a little sorry to say that I know um, Dr. Allison Ashley Cock um, could not attend to the end of the meeting. Um, so I, I'm sure she'll have some comments for you probably by email, um, but I want to start with um, anyone on the internet who has questions. Did you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Could be clear or not clear at all. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I have a question. Um, I was surprised by the basal angle and the Wackenheim angle. Um, you know how you showed that right towards the end and that these measurements were correlated with some of the genetic alterations? Um, between This was between the, the control group and then your, your Chiari group when it was, um, um, you know, narrowed down, yeah. right? Um, the reason why I was surprised is because I thought from um, from your paper that the basal angle and the Wackenheim angle was not different between the uh, patients and the healthy subjects. Is that right? Because I, I thought, yeah, I thought those angles didn't, they weren't different between the two groups. Yeah, I think uh, basal angle uh, present a statistical significant difference, but not in Wackenheim angle. But uh, we thought it was uh, it was due that we had a little mix of kind of carry malformation type one patients. 
because when we we define the model the mathematical the mathematical model, we didn't know how patients had a, a small posterior cranial fossa. So it could be done in these uh, 100 patients. There are anyone or someone who who has not the posterior cranial fossa small and then the Wackenheim angle alterated. Right, maybe maybe I can. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll find here. I'll find here. Uh, what Anxani is saying is that when we did our uh, morphometric study, uh, patients were uh, selected on the basis of uh, uh, the uh, tonsillar descent criteria, while in the genetic study, patients were uh, grouped. Uh, in, uh, according to the, the whole posterior fossa morphology. So probably these, are, these two cohorts represent different subsets of Chiari patients. Uh, okay, I understand now, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, I have many other questions for you, actually. Um, in, a, in a recent project, we're working with the University of Michigan, and we have uh, pediatric um, Chiari patients um, where we have matched, you know, ones that are symptomatic with mild herniation and ones that are not uh, symptomatic also with mild herniation. So basically around five millimeter tonsillar descent. In our initial analysis, it appears like uh, dimensions of the posterior fossa are smaller in the symptomatic uh, patients for pediatric. Now, in your study, we also have the data that you sent us, and in that data for adults, it looks more like, um, you know, many structures high up in the brain are kind of low, right? They're the tentorium and the fastigium and the top of the pons. All those structures are low, and, I, and I'm wondering um, if you have any ideas about that, because it seems like the posterior fossa, the bones are smaller in the children than in the adults. These structures in the brain are low. Um, although I guess in the adults, you, you saw posterior fossa was also smaller, but you know many other parameters were also uh, lower lying, where in the children, this was not the case. Uh, I, I'm not sure I, I understood completely. So first thing is, the patients you mentioned as asymptomatic were discovered just by chance when when studying headaches or something like that. That's right. Okay. So uh, maybe Anjana can help here, but but uh, I think that the shallowness of of the posterior fossa is is what was found in 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 our adult morphometric study. Is is that right, Anjani? Yeah, I think so, but I'm not uh, very sure. So, well, I, it's a. It's so, a so I, I'm not. I'm not sure what's the difference between uh, the two the two situations. So, so, what you're saying is, in the adult group, you also found just based in, in general small posterior fossa. Yes. Yes. These are what I would say. Maybe. maybe uh, I don't know if the, if the uh, uh, the paper as as written may may uh, make understand uh, different than that, but but this is what we found. Well, so what I want what I'm saying is, um, in addition, though, you had you know high p-value changes for other structures very high up in the brain, like the the fastigium and uh, near the corpus callosum, right, in that adult group. I think the pew values uh, indicated that the distance to the, to those structures were uh, much lower it, it, as an indirect indication of, of uh, a small posterior fossa. Uh, I have to I have to look at it more, but I I thought um, okay. they were similar in terms of their statistical relevance. You know, uh, I'll, I'll we'll we'll look at it more, but I felt like okay. that was sort of an indicator that. For the adults, maybe something else is going on besides just the posterior fossa being smaller, or maybe the disease has progressed, and yeah. you know mm -hmm. more of the brain has sort of descended for some reason. Um, okay. okay, yeah, that would, that make, would sense. make sense. Yeah. 
Um, another question. So in your linkage analysis um, at the beginning, Alphonse, when you were talking, I think you identified uh, two chromosomes um, that were, you know, different in the Chiari group. And I was yes. curious to know if um, you said that chromosome was associated with neural tube defect. And I think, as I remember in uh, Ashley uh, Allison's uh, paper, they had, uh, they, in their linkage analysis, they found a chromosome that was more related to Ehlers-Danlos. Maybe. maybe uh, and, and I'm wondering if yeah. you have any comments on that, like, um, or, and also Kuiper-Fels syndrome. Yeah. yeah. Are those similar uh, chromosomes, or are they, uh, you know, are they related? Uh, I, I realize maybe I, I didn't explain uh, myself clear enough. Uh, uh, the two chromosomes we we found in in our first uh, linkage analysis uh, was. Uh, Related to the CM1 phenotype, not not to neural tube defects. Um, the only thing is that when we gathered the uh, complete uh, pedigree and add, added more uh, markers to the critical regions, then the only region that emerged as significant was the one in chromosome 17, which interestingly contains the N NF1 gene and SUS12 gene, uh, but the other two uh, uh, went down to a, to a low ladder score and were discarded. But, but uh, they, they were not related in any, in any way to neural tube defects. Okay, I probably, it's, it's um, I'm not an expert in genetics, so it's hard for me to understand all that, but overall, I mean, if you had to comment on um, comparison of your results with uh, the group at Duke, is there anything, I mean, are there any similarities or differences? It, it seems like your methods were um, actually very similar in, in the way you uh, went about looking at the genes and then afterwards looking at the morphometrics and then trying to narrow down your groups, uh, you know, and doing a iteration, narrowing down your subject group and then reanalyzing. Right. The, the difference to me is that in our our family was supposed to harbor a, a, a large effect gene. Um, I mean, 13 people affected, or 12 people affected after excluding, uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, obvious cases, uh, would mean a, a gene with a, a very large effect and maybe private to that family while the study by uh, Allison and colleagues, uh, uh, I think that is uh, included, I don't know, 66 families, something like that. So even, even the families were smaller, uh, they, they could detect with that strategy genes uh, with a, let's say, medium size effect. I mean, genes that would determine uh, a tendency to developing Chiari malformation, but perhaps uh, in those families, other factors could be at play, like uh, genetic modifiers or environmental uh, factors. This is the way I look at that. Um, I, I may be wrong, but uh, a multi-generational family like ours should identify one single locus, while in the other group of families, probably several locus may may emerge and the fact is that there is no coincidence between our uh, locus and, and Allison's uh, group one so this, but, but this is not surprising given the the size of the families I don't know if uh, if that uh, responds to your question you're just saying that since you have a very different subject uh, group in the families that your different results are are not surprising and so compared to other studies in the literature, when you're doing this kind of genetic analysis, of uh, you, you find similar difficulties. Uh, yes, in general, if, if we have a large pedigree with many cases in different generations, uh, this is uh, likely to identify a, a disease-causing gene by, by, by just by itself, so the, just one family. The other strategy is to, get, to pull together many small families 
and and depending on whether you suspect autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive uh, models, you can use different strategies. But in, in the second case, you expect more more than one uh, locus to be at play. Uh, this is the uh, the idea I was trying to convey. Hi, this is uh, Frank Loth here. I, I'm also not an expert in genetics. Uh, could you maybe put in, in words what, if a, if a family that has a Chiari patient comes to me and asks me and they say, how important are genetics in Chiari malformation? I always have difficulty answering that question. Could I put that question to you and, and get your thoughts? I, I know it's not completely figured out, but get your thoughts on, on how likely genetics are playing a role in Chiari malformation and sort of some kind of uh, your thoughts on motivation towards moving in that direction to do more research because it's going to produce uh, uh, fantastic results or or is your what, what's your uh, your sort of projection of the future uh, capabilities of using this sort of genetic analysis well, yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for the question, which is uh, very interesting. I, I, I think that when one is when one is faced with that with that question, of course, we don't have a, a clear answer. But uh, I would lean towards considering uh, Chiari one malformation as a complex disorder in most cases. That means that uh, m most geneticists would would consider. Uh, the malformation as a, as a polygenic uh, uh, disorder plus uh, environmental or perhaps epigenetic disorder. So many factors contributing to the risk of developing Chiari. And in that setting, I would give a low risk of recurrence in a, in, in a family. Of course, there's a few uh, <coughs> Uh, family cases reported, but but this continue to be a minority. And and my experience in I, I guess this reflects also your experience and other people's experiences in the in the clinic is that uh, most uh, when when one studies uh, uh, a, a sibling of a patient, you know, the, the most usual result is is a negative result. So so I think these studies uh, can give insight into the uh, pathogenesis of the disorder. I mean, when, when we find a rare variant causing a, a familial variant, a familial form of the of Chiari, we'll probably shed light on the pathways implicated. And then we will have to look into common variants in the very same genes. And this can be then useful for a, a lot more of uh, cases. And the family cases will, will shed light on the sporadic or complex cases. At least this is what happened in other, in other pathologies. Okay, thanks very much. I have another uh, question about the morphometrics that you've done. I think um, Ansani showed a slide, really nice slide, with a review of the other morphometric studies that had been done in the literature. Yeah. It showed a bunch of authors. And that wasn't in your paper, was it? No. No, it's such a nice slide. No. I, I want to get that slide from you. Um, I couldn't take it all in. Um, my question is, um, you know, you've done such a nice review of all these studies. Um, what do you think should be done um, next? And um, as you know, we're, we're doing this machine learning uh, algorithm, and we have several uh, – we have some results that take into account, for example, two variables from your study, and we get a similar uh, specificity. So your your percent uh, separation of your different subject groups at about 93%, I think it was. Um, you know, we can do this with fewer number of parameters. But I'm just wondering is, you know, overall, looking at this review, what are we missing or what do you think should be done next? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, I think in, in our uh, morphometric study, uh, ca uh, carriers the um, uh, how do you say uh, the 
the CFS, the CFS parameters. Uh, we only uh, evaluate the, the posterior coronal fossa, but not the uh, not the cephalometrical cephalorachidial fluids. And in most of the patients, uh, they are affected by this, and maybe it could be a good good parameter to analyze and to be included. I mean, CSF dynamics uh, measurement. So, I mean, in context of what you're just saying in terms of the genetics being complex, I mean, you're already pretty high in terms of the sensitivity of this measurement. You're at, you know, 93%. Um, do you, I mean, can we get it any higher considering that the subject that the patients are pretty heterogeneous? I mean, that seems pretty I, I, high already. Should we just stop there and call it a day? <laughs> what, what do you think, Ainzane? I, I believe it's pretty high, but uh, as, as Ainzane was suggesting, our uh, neurologists uh, told us that perhaps performing routine uh, uh, CSF uh, um, evaluation, uh, I mean, uh, sequen uh, sequences on, on the MRI study as a, as a routine of uh, uh, using those parameters maybe could enhance the uh, sensitivity. But of course, 93 is okay. Actually, so that's one thing we can talk about more in the, in the um, you know, the analysis we're doing based on your paper, your 19 morphometrics, we're doing in several studies that we have ongoing in our lab where we also have CSF flow studies for every case. So mm -hmm. we'll be able to take those into account and see how they compare to um, just the 19 morphometrics that you presented. So uh, Absolutely. That, that, yeah. The group is that'd smaller. be great. The the groups are smaller in our study. We don't have a hundred patients like you guys have. That's incredible. Hmm. Um, so, does anyone else? I haven't really given a lot of opportunity uh, for people online. Does anyone else have questions? And also in this room here. How about 